Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. This is Kurt Rosner. I'm the East Valley Astronomy Club president. Welcome to this month's general online meeting. And as usual, on the agenda, we'll have a welcome. We'll have introductions to the club members, as usual. There'll be some club news. And then uh, we have two member presentations this time. One from, from Steve Dodder and uh, another one from uh, Wayne Thomas and Tony George. Then we will move into our main presentation from Dave Iker. So, as remember, on every time we have this is to live long and prosper. Introductions, I always put this slide up so everyone remembers who the leadership team is for the EVAC club. And notice there's a difference this time. The positions are open. Those in orange font, there's two positions that are, that are now open. Um, David Hatch, uh, one of our board members who has been great help for years, is uh, just kind of overloaded these times. And uh, he decided that it would be best to step out and let someone else take over. So Dave has done a fantastic job and we want to we want to thank him for all of his hard work during all these years. So that means that we have a board of directors position open. So if anyone is interested, let me know. Get on the, um, on the website and on the president link. Click it. And let me know. It's an email to me. And let me know you're interested. Now, what does the board of directors do? They kind of keep their eye on the astronomy community you know, on, uh, on what's going on. And then if anything comes up on the club, shall we implement it, shall we not? If uh, there is questions about implementation, I bring it to the board and then the board votes on it. So it's basically a pretty easy position in the sense you are there basically to vote on things uh, for the club. Now the rest of the board members have been fantastic. All the board members have been fantastic given their opinions and what they find out. So it's a, it's a good position, it's a nice position, and especially it's a good kind of lead in for the other um, uh, elected positions later on. Now the property manager is another open position that David Hatch filled. And what this is, is we have uh, often people who want to donate equipment to the club, and then we maintain that equipment and then uh, uh, give it out, you could give it out to a school and maybe involved in an auction, something like that. So what does it involve? Oh, I would say, you know, occasionally you'd have to go to a, a place and check out the equipment and make sure it's actually worth, worth getting. And then you keep a log, keep a log book and, and you bring it to the Greco Observatory. There's a shed that we have there. Um, so that position is open. These two positions will be open through to the end of the year uh, when we have uh, our elections. So it's a short-term position for right now. So think about that. Let me know and get involved more and more in this great club that we have. So our next EVAC meeting, remember Friday the 18th of June at 7.30 p.m. And this time uh, coming up would be Bob King. And he's a Sky and Telescope contributor, plus wrote a few books. Um, and his topic is the adventures in visual observing. So we don't want to miss this one because, of course, this is something that we basically all do. So let's see what uh, Bob has to say about that. Club news. Greco is open for private star parties. Now, these private events, this was announced last month that we were going to open. And so these uh, private events are open on Sunday through Thursday for small groups, generally they're fa uh, family gatherings. They run about 90 minutes. Yeah, a picture of the observatory is up at the uh, upper right there. Greco stands for Gilbert Rotary Centennial Observatory. So uh, attendance requirements are listed on the schedule request. So what people do is they go into our website and now they, they are now uh, uh, able to sign up for one of these evenings where our Greco manager, Claude Haynes, will be in there and these small groups, what he does is he, uh, he moves the telescope around to various things in the sky and then explains what's going on. So because of the small um, uh, space inside the observatory, 
we had not been open at all. So now we're starting to kind of uh, dip our toes in the water, right? And say, these gatherings and see how things go. And these private star parties have been great. Fantastic, everything has worked out fine. They've all followed the requirements. So we decided, the board of directors decided to continue on with, uh, with the public events or the private star parties. However, not open to the public yet. The public viewings are on Fridays and Saturdays where anyone can walk on up. And we've had lines that are um, uh, 100 people deep waiting to get on in. And at this point, we really can't control um, a crowd yet. We really don't know how to do that yet. So we're going to wait. We'll have another board meeting next month, the end of next month, and find out should we open it up to the next step or not. Now, all the other EVAC personal contact events still remain canceled. Meetings, public star parties outreach events. Um, still, we don't know exactly the process yet to ensure the safety of our guests and those people involved in this. But we're getting close, that's for sure. And uh, we just have to wait for a while. We're, we really don't want to open up yet. So keep looking, uh, keep looking at our website and, of course, joining in on our meetings here and uh, you'll be up to date on, on when things are going to open back up. But we certainly are getting close. And this sheet is exactly the same as the last few months have been. Remember, remember presentations, if you're interested, come on, let's do it. And uh, remember articles, remember if you have a short article, you know, a page or so, about something that you like that you want to share with the club, by all means. You know, uh, send it to me, and uh, we'll get you in on the on a, our monthly newsletter. And remember that these monthly meetings are being recorded, and a link is provided on our EVAC website if you go into the uh, uh, presentations portion of it and the monthly meetings portion of it. So remember from last month, uh, uh, Bob Bukhine had given a presentation about the Society for Astronomical Sciences, the symposium coming up in June. So I thought I'd put this slide back on up because it is coming up next month. There's a charge for it, $20 and $40. The $20 is for members. If you're a member of the Society for Astronomical Sciences, it's $20. If you're not a member, it's $40. Now, what you can do is you can join for $25, and then uh, registration is $20. So, so for uh, $5 more, actually, you can basically be a member for, uh, for the entire year. And what is this? Um, this? There's presentations about what we as amateur astronomers and small telescopes can do to, um, to uh, provide data uh, for the astronomy community different things that we can do with our small telescopes. So I'm uh, registered, I'm in there, I'm, I'm ready to go watch. So I'll definitely be watching in there. Everything is online. And if you sign up for it, you'll get a schedule on what's going on. So first up, we have member presentation. Steve Dodder will give us a uh, short little presentation about a uh, uh, Grand Canyon North Rim Star Party Coordinator is needed for next year. So, Steve, take it over, bud. Yes. Okie doke. Hi, everybody. Thanks for letting me uh, talk to you guys tonight. Um, the last year was canceled. The North Rim, uh, the Star Party at the Grand Canyon was canceled on both rims last year and this year as well. Um, the year before, I was. Uh, starting to groom somebody to take over. It's, uh, it's been 15 years at the North Rim and I think it's about time for somebody else to try and um, organize the event. Um, I was, like I said, I was grooming somebody, but uh, they, they dropped out last year after the COVID hit and uh, they decided they, they weren't ready for that kind of a commitment. Um, so I'd like to, I published a, a open letter in the Solar Astronomy Club uh, newsletter, and I sent the same the same text over to the to your to the evac uh, uh, newsletter editor. Hopefully that was published. I don't I don't get your newsletter, so I don't know if it was in there. I, I would assume so. 
in a couple of weeks. But basically, I'm just asking for somebody to take over the event so it doesn't uh, go off into the weeds. Um, I've set up a pretty pretty good system there. I'll tell you right up front that there is kind of a lot of work, but it comes in little chunks as, as the year goes by. Um, I start organizing. The event is always in June, the dark of the moon in June, at both rims and at the Kaibab Lodge uh, outside the park. Um, but I, I've set up a you know, I've set up a, a, a spreadsheet basically that uh, helps you organize everything, write down your volunteers and their email uh, addresses and uh, all the uh, uh, talks and what campsites they're assigned to and that kind of thing. <clears throat> it's all basically boiled down to one little thing. So by the time the star party comes, it pretty much runs itself. It's just the preparation up, uh, up until that point that you need to get, uh, that you need to take care of. Um, I'm willing to hang on for a year or another year or whatever it takes if somebody wants to uh, uh, join us at the North Rim and I follow along as, uh, as uh, I, I fill out the spreadsheet to organize all those things. And uh, so you can get a feel of how it's going to go. You know, I, I'm willing to do that for a year or two even if somebody decides they want to take me up on it or a couple of people want to split the split the duties or whatever. Um, <clears throat> the South Rim had a similar situation and uh, gosh, just a year before, uh, before I got there 14 years ago. And uh, they, Dean Kettleson was running it from the Tucson Astronomy, Tucson uh, Amateur Astronomy Association. And when he decided to retire from the position, he, they split it up into a committee. So they've got five or six people running it down at the South Rim. The North Rim is a much, much smaller event. Um, pretty much the only thing in common is the name Grand Canyon Star Party. Um, the, the event is smaller. The, the, you don't generally view as late into the night uh, as they do at the South Rim. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a lot easier. They have, I've found that the North Rim, about the maximum number of scopes we can have on the field is about 12. Um, the optimum number is about 10 with a couple of, you know, big chunks of glass like my 20 inch and another guy has an 18 inch, it's pretty regular. Uh, but at the South Rim, they have up to 60 or 70 astronomers and telescopes and they rotate in and out. They, they set up in a huge uh, parking lot for, for tour buses uh, during, during the week. And we set up right on the veranda at the North Rim. So it's, uh, it's a space about 40 feet by 70 feet long. And then there's still picnic tables and, and the chairs that they set up set up right at the rim. Can you s uh, swing back to that picture of the of the uh, veranda at all? Yeah, perfect. See, you know, that's the, that's the site right there. That's my 20 inch right in the front there, and uh, various and sundry other telescopes I'll set up along the uh, around the veranda. Um, it's a Terrific place to view the sky. Um, all those lights turn out when the uh, when the party starts. This was taken around uh, between. It looks like the sun is not quite down, but the lights come on and they turn them off for us. But you're right on the rim. You can you, you, the the mountain in the background there is one of the it's one of the side canyons of the of the Grand Canyon, and so you're right on the rim. You can't from the south rim. You can't even see the canyon. You have to you have to walk a, a couple hundred yards. Um, over to the rim, but at the north rim, you're right there, and uh, that's about all the space that we have right there. You can see there's that's a crowd before, maybe some people at the tables eating uh, eating dinner and that kind of stuff. Hey, but, hey uh, Steve, I, I noticed you, uh, you you caught me in the lower left hand corner, dinking with my uh, platform. <laughs> yeah, there you are. You got my Hawkeye uh, swoop, hoodie on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's a it's a great place. I mean, uh, the the skies are really dark. It's a thousand feet higher than the South Rim, and uh, it's just a wonderful place to it's just a wonderful place to have a star party. The people are great. Um, we give talks in the auditorium, which is off the off the image to your to your right. Uh, if you go up those stairs and go through the doors, uh, that's where the auditorium is, and we give our talks in there. So um, it, it's a great experience, and it's even more fun. It's even more fun uh, after you've. If you've done all this work for you know during the year and get everybody all together and when it all comes together at the end it's just there's just nothing quite like it um i don't did i have a did i have my email on there yes 
Uh, there's my contact information. If you could take that down, it's also on the Saguaro Astronomy Club website. Um, you can email me there, uh, fester00 at hotmail.com. Just go ahead and uh, you know, send me an email if you're interested and uh, I'll, I'll sign you up for next year. Um, hopefully we'll have it next year. The dates are on the, uh, the SAC website. Let me see real quick here. Um, yeah, I just put your email on the chat, Steve. Yeah, great. And uh, let's see, it's not doing it there. So I think it's the 13th to the 20th next next year, but I'm going to look that up real quick. Um, I generally start uh, looking at the reservations and things like that in August. And uh, for people that set up their own um, observing, their own uh, lodging, but we have uh, usually 10, uh, 10 or 11 uh, free campsites that you can camp for free for eight days. And if you're if you're a regular, you know, regular visitor, you can you know, the maximum is seven days, so you get an extra night for free. And, and the only stipulation is that you have to set up your telescope six of the eight nights that you're there. So the rules are the same. A lot of you are probably familiar with them. Uh, if not, I encourage you to go either to the TAAA. Uh, Saguaro Astron or Grand Canyon Star Party or the, or, or the SAC Club, um, the SAC website and uh, under the events it says Grand Canyon Star Party, you can look under there. Next year's event is June 18th to the 25th. So that's, uh, that's when it's going to happen. Hopefully next year it will be, you know, stable enough. I can, I can understand what the Park Service is going after because it's completely impossible if you saw that, you know, the picture of the veranda kind of says it all. There's no way you could control, you know, keep people far enough apart there or, or how to control them to coming in and out and that kind of stuff. So hopefully we'll have things squared away by next year. They're going to let me know for sure. And um, I hope so, somebody will sign up and, uh, and help me out. Get, uh, get some experience under your belt next year and uh, maybe run it yourself the year after. I will definitely still be going to the Grand Canyon Star Party rather at the North Rim, rather whether I uh, whether I coordinate it or not. So there's no you know there's no problem there. You have at least a 20 inch telescope, and I just completed a, 20, a 12 and a half inch f6. It's a very nice telescope. It's got a Pierre Schwer meter mirror in it, and that's going to be my my uh, public outreach telescope. It's a lot easier to move around than the 20, but it's got real good optics. In it. So. Give me a, you know, send me an email or let me know if anybody has any questions. Uh, go ahead and ask away. Okay, thank you, Steve. You and so, yeah, I encourage anyone who's interested in this because, um, you know, as a uh, amateur astronomer as we are, I mean, this would be a life's highlight to be able to coordinate this. Well, as president, when I get asked, uh, where's a good place to, where's a good dark sky place for observing? I always say, the rim of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and then I go, oh, well, you mean local, like around Phoenix. And then, of course, I have to go from there. But my first thought is best place in this state to uh, to see the night sky, the rim of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I encourage if anyone uh, wants to take this over the coordinator or even help get a hold of Steve and make sure that this great event continues on. Yeah, I'll still I'll still start uh, taking reservations in August and for next year, just like just like it's going to be a normal year, and uh, we'll see how it, we'll see how it goes. All right, good. Thanks, Steve. Thanks a lot, guys. Sure. Okay, and the next up is Wayne Thomas and Tony George about asteroid occultations. So Wayne. Okay. Let's see if I can um, make this work here. I'll stop sharing. Looks good from here. Okay. Well, Tony George apologizes for not being here. He didn't realize that he had a dinner date scheduled. So he says, Wayne, can you handle it on your own? I says, okay. <laughs> so what we wanted to do is to share our experiences so far in May and what's coming up for the rest of May to just kind of give you an idea of, of how much activity is really going on here 
in Phoenix and Arizona in general. So I publish a list that goes out uh, monthly telling what uh, asteroid occultations are coming that might be of interest to persons who are new to occultation astronomy. So that's kind of uh, the kickoff for this. But maybe first, what's a, what is an asteroid occultation? Well, it's simply a shadow. It Probably the best analogy is a solar, uh, solar eclipse where something gets in the way of the light from the sun, the moon, and it causes a shadow on the Earth. In a similar way, uh, an asteroid can get in the path of a, a starlight uh, from a distance and um, cause a shadow on the Earth. Uh, excuse me just a moment. I have to take care of something. So um, with that said, um, here's uh, what we plan to do and, and have accomplished this month. There were five uh, asteroid occultations predicted um, for the Phoenix area and, and parts of uh, Arizona. Uh, we had uh, several people sign up for it. Probably the most uh, important one was Patroclus. Uh, we had 44 people sign up for it with uh, uh, seven people got cords, positive cords, and seven people got misses. And the other uh, portion of that number either didn't observe or had clouds or technical failure or something like that. So uh, of all those that uh, signed up, we had quite a few positives. Um, for Nata, we had five positives. For Hispania, five. And for Eurydike, we had one. For the remainder of this month, I'm not very happy because the probabilities for Greco are practically zero. So unless you're willing to travel, um, there isn't much uh, uh, until June. So the first one that, that I wanted to share was a very strange one. Uh, for one thing, it's extremely faint. My equipment is, has a really hard time getting down to mag 15 and 16. So this one was a case where the asteroid was brighter than the star. So the magnitude drop was only three tenths of a magnitude. However, it was going to be a really long um, occultation, uh, just over 17 seconds uh, for a maximum. You'll see from the map that uh, Tony's position up here is on the right side of the green line, which is the center line of the path. And my uh, observing station in Florence is on the left side or the west side of the path. The uh, blue lines here represent the edges of the uh, predicted shadow path. And the red lines represent uh, the one sigma uncertainty in the path. So the results were very strange. Tony got a positive, I got a negative. And we were, our core, our positions were very close to the center line. So this is a case where we really don't know what happened. The next one is for a near Earth asteroid Apophis. At one time, people were really scared that maybe Apophis was going to come back and hit the Earth here in a, uh, in a couple of decades. Since then, we've determined that the path is not going to hit us just yet. Maybe in some future uh, century, but not, not right now. However, this is a, a very dangerous asteroid. If you put four football fields end to end, that's how big the diameter is. So in order to um, measure this uh, occultation, uh, David uh, Dunham set up a, a setup where we had several locations or tracks where he wanted people to set up. So Tony's uh, setup was up here on the second one from the center. In this map, the, the yellow line is the center line. And Tony was up here on Happy Valley Road, the second one over. And then we had uh, several others. I don't think we had all tracks represented, but we had, had several of them represented. So the results were uh, that we have a much better location of the asteroid now. Uh, based on these four chords. Um, one guy from Mexico, uh, Tony was in Avondale, 
Uh, Ted Blank was in Surprise. Uh, Norm Carlson was down near the Mexican border. And then there were some others that are not, uh, other chords that are not represented here. But what this does for us is it gives us a very specific location at a point in time of where this asteroid is. Then what we can do with that is, is input that to the model that represents the orbit of the asteroid and get much better predictions of where it's going to be in the future. May was an, another difficult one. Uh, it's a pretty faint star, 14th magnitude. That's it's probably a little fainter than I like to work with. Um, it's uh, not too bad for altitude and azimuth. The uh, duration is reasonable. Uh, and the probability is a sure thing. Notice that on the track, green is the center line, the blue is the, the borders of the path, and the uncertainties, one and three sigma, are quite narrow. So th this should be a, a sure thing uh, for these people up here in North Scottsdale and Cave Creek, and for me down here in Florence. However, uh, people in Carefree, Scottsdale, and Fountain Hills got positives, and from Florence, I got a miss. What happened must have been that the path shifted a bit. And even though I was within the predicted path, uh, the shadow didn't cross me. For Nata, the, it's a little better situation. It's a little brighter star, a good magnitude drop, a reasonable location in the sky. So uh, I think I did this one from Tempe, and uh, we had the following results. Here is uh, the video of that event. And if you look at this star uh, in the center of the screen, you'll notice there are some stars that look really, really sharp. Well, those are hot pixels. They're, they're not stars. But this one is the star. And you'll see it wink out when the asteroid goes in front of it. So that's what we live for. The uh, video display has a, uh, a video time inserter on it, which inserts the, the universal time down to the 10th of a millisecond. And from that, we can put it into software and uh, determine when the asteroid winked out, or I should say when the star winked out and when it came back. And then using that, we, we can predict where the asteroid was at that moment in time. Here's the graph uh, showing the comparison star with green uh, dots representing it, and the actual star that was occulted represented by the blue dots. And you can see a significant drop in the brightness of the star. We had observers stretched all the way from almost Mexico up to uh, uh, Lake Tahoe, near Lake Tahoe in uh, the west part of Nevada for this one. From this data, we're able to uh, plot where the asteroid was uh, and what its uh, gross shape was. There are other uh, techniques that give a better shape, but for this one, I think they said this was the second time that we had observed an occultation of this asteroid. For Hispania, this is a rather large asteroid. Uh, it, the predicted path covered most of Arizona. Um, since the asteroid was brighter than the star, the magnitude drop was not very great. And the results most of the chords were centrally located. The uh, elapsed time of the disappearance were all similar for, for all of us. You will note, though, that the error bars on my observation are larger than the error bars on some of the other observations. This is probably due to the fact that I integrated uh, for more uh, frames than the others. I think I had to integrate uh, maybe for a half a second, something like that. 
for Albina, uh, again, this is a very challenging one for me. Uh, this was uh, just a couple of nights ago. It was very faint, uh, star at uh, almost 14th magnitude. And uh, for this one, I think I had to integrate a full second in order to get enough uh, intensity to measure. So if you, when you look at the, uh, the data, I think there are only two data points down here representing my out. So the, uh, the software was able to determine that I got a 2.1 second out. For Alvina, this is the gross shape. Uh, again, the error bars on my data are quite large because of the large integration time. So what's coming? Well, not much for the rest of this uh, month. Unless you're willing to drive to the four corners, I wouldn't try 92 Udina. I mean, it's again, a bright asteroid, a faint star, uh, but unless you're going for 100% probability, uh, I, I wouldn't drive there. For Palinurus, uh, the, even if you're on the center line, the probability is only 25%. So again, I wouldn't do that. For Ingeborg, from Sanders, again, it's one in six. So that, that probably wouldn't do it. Although the star is nice and bright, um, the, the probability is, is a bit on the low side. Thyra would be a nice one. It's a large asteroid. If you go to Sedona, you have a near sure thing of it, uh, but it's, it's a bright asteroid, a faint star, and uh, not a very uh, large magnitude drop. Uh, at the end of the month, uh, if you go to Cottonwood, you get one out of two probability for that one. So what's for next month? There's one that I think would be worthwhile, and that is uh, 2426 Simonov. Uh, if you are in Chandler, you have almost a sure thing, 70 or 84.8% chance of it. Uh, it's a bright star, good magnitude drop, reasonable altitude. Uh, the maximum duration is reasonable. So I think we should give that one a, a, a good consideration. So in summary, there's a bunch of us that are doing this in the area, in, uh, located in the Phoenix area. And we'd love to have you join us and, and uh, enjoy the fun. So I have some references in case you want to do that. Uh, I, I have an email list. If you send me a, an email, I will put you on my list and share what I I'll share. David Dunham takes this information and puts it on a website of the uh, John Hopkins uh, University Applied Physics Lab website. I get my data from a cult watcher. Uh, and you can download that here. And I would highly recommend that even if you don't want to do asteroid occultations. What it does is it tells you what's coming and a lot of the parameters that you might be interested in. If you're interested in buying equipment to do what I do and what uh, the others of us do, uh, you can go to the IOTA website and they have uh, recommended equipment there. You can buy a package, I think, for $530 plus shipping, which has everything you need for uh, observing asteroid occultations except the telescope and the computer. And then there's some documentation to show you how, how to do this. And Do, are there any questions? <clears throat> Sounds like we're good. Ah. There's one one question there, Wayne. Um, what what type of telescopes are used for this? Are good. I think we're losing your, I think you're having a 
internet issues, Wayne? You're, you're dropping out. Maybe if you could um, type the answer to that in the chat. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, now I can. Okay. Um, I have an 11 inch Schmidt Casa grain on a local toilet mount. Uh, the type of setup I use is um, different than what a lot of others do. A lot of others have a, a telescope they pre-point to a, a location in the sky that they know the asteroid occultation will occur in, and then they turn off all the drives and just wait. Uh, so it's a, a different technique than I use. I like to get on the star early and track it right into the occultation. Woody had one question for you, um, Wayne, about um, what was the magnitude scale, intensity scale on your um, your graphs. Um, it's a relative uh, brightness. The um, the software uh, tells me what the magnitude drop is, but it doesn't tell me what the magnitude of the star was or the magnitude of the asteroid. Um, so that's a, a different a different problem statement than than what the software addresses. The predictions tell me what the magnitude drop should be, and then the software tells me what it thinks the magnitude drop was that I measured. I don't know if that uh, answers enough of your question or not, Woody. And then Tom had a, uh, Tom Palikas had a response. Woody, I think it doesn't matter. The star is either on or off. What I have run into is a suspicious occultation that could have been an artifact of noise. And what Tony George has uh, instilled in me is make sure that the magnitude drop uh, is sufficient to satisfy what the predicted magnitude drop was. And if you have something that's only 10 or 20 percent of the predicted drop, it's probably an artifact. All right, I think uh, I think that's it. No more questions came on in. So Wayne, thank you, thank you for that. You're welcome. As everyone knows, Wayne is heavily in, uh, involved in in occultation. So any questions? Uh, certainly, Wayne is the, Wayne's the go-to person on that. And he can always use some help, just like uh, just like everyone. So Tom, I'm going to give it back to you. And you can introduce our main speaker, Dave. All right, thank you, Gordon. Welcome. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce our main speaker, okay. Dave Eicher. Um, Dave's, Dave's background is just amazing. It's so varied. Um, I think you could talk to us on about 10 different subjects. <laughs> I think tonight you're limiting it to astronomy. Um, so just a quick background, Dave's been with Astronomy Magazine for 36 years, beginning as an assistant editor and working through associate, senior, and managing positions. And he's been the magazine's chief editor since 2002, almost 20 years now. Awesome. Dave's also written many books on astronomy, you know, over a dozen, and also uh, written nine books on American history, including The Longest Night, a Military History of the Civil War, Dixie Betrayed, How the South Really Lost the Civil War, and Civil War High Commands. And in 1990, International Astronom Astronomical Union named a minor planet 3617 Iker for Dave in recognition of his service to astronomy. And Dave was president of the Astronomy Foundation, the Telescope Industry and Astronomy Outreach Group from 2011 to 2017. Dave's appeared on CNN, a CNN Headline News, MSNBC, Fox News Channel, National Public Radio, and other media outlets to promote the science and hobby of astronomy. He's written planetarium shows for the 
Adler Planetarium in Chicago and film strips for NASA. And shifting gears once more, he's also an accomplished rock and blues drummer. Dave uh, enjoys jamming with his colleagues at Kambach Publishing, and the focus is on blues and blues rock, centering on the styles of Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, Cream, Allman Brothers, Creedence Clearwater Revival, and others. Good choices there. Uh, Dave's talk tonight is titled uh, Galaxies Inside the Universe's Star Cities. So um, if we could all clap virtually, give a warm welcome to Dave and turn it over to Dave. Thank you so much, Tom, and it's good to see you and some new friends and some very old friends too, like Tom Palakis, who I've known for many, many years, a good pal. And I wonder if I can share my screen now or whether I need to maybe, let me try you it. You should here. be able to. Okay, yeah. Can you see that? Yes. And maybe I'll see if I can start a slide. Does that look okay? It looks awesome. Can you hear me okay? Sounds great to me. Very good. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I wanted to talk about uh, ancient history of the universe uh, to start off with back when I was young, many, many years ago. One of my favorite books, uh, sort of growing up as a teenager, was Tim Ferriss's book, among others, Galaxies, which I loved. It was a fantastic explanation of galaxies, favorite kind of object of mine. And it had, some of you guys know probably, it, it had these wonderful sort of pseudo three-dimensional diagrams of, of stars around us in the Milky Way and of the local group and distant galaxies and so on. It was just really captivating. And I always thought that, you know, someday I'd love to write a sort of an update of that book. Um, and that happened last year. So if you'll permit me a quick crass plug, uh, this book, Galaxies of Mine, came out uh, last year from Random House, which um, astonishingly, as, as you guys know, many of you, so much has, has happened in terms of research, not only since Tim Ferriss wrote his book in 1980, obviously, a uh, whole generation or more ago. But uh, the last 10 or 15 years really has been an explosion in what uh, astronomers uh, know about galaxies and, and have determined about some of the most important properties and behaviors and evolution of them. So I wanted to talk a little bit tonight about that, if I could. So this whole business, of course, goes back to one night, essentially, October 4th, 1923, uh, when Edwin Hubble, who was a great astronomer, a uh, relatively young astronomer at the time, not the most popular guy necessarily, he could be a little gruff with his comrades, um, but he was fanatically interested in studying what were known as spiral nebulae, of course, at the time. Um, this was in Los Angeles, at, at, up at Mount Wilson. He, he trekked up to use the uh, relatively new 100-inch Hooker telescope, the largest telescope in the world at that time that had taken the title over from Lord Ross's telescope in rural Ireland, of all things. Um, but, but it was a very different place, Los Angeles, of course, then in, in the early 1920s. It was a city of about a million population at Caltech. Robert Milliken had uh, just won the Nobel Prize in physics for measuring the charge carried by a single electron and, and the photoelectric effect across town. And the young Amelia Earhart uh, was taking flying lessons, and a uh, young cartoonist, Walt Disney, arrived in the city with $40 in his pocket and some big ideas. So on Mount Wilson, in, in the fall of 1923, Hubble trekked up on one of his many nights, and he was fanatically interested in taking plates of his favorite object, spiral nebulae. Uh, he took a plate of the Andromeda Nebula, one of his favorite uh, objects, um, and of course, at the time, most people thought that these nebulae were inside our galaxy. Uh, the distant scale of the universe was not at all understood yet, among other things. Um, and he excitedly thought that he had uh, found a nova, which of course you can see on this famous plate near the top of the plate with tick marks with the N. Um, and that was exciting for him. And the next night he took another uh, plate, this one, um, actually, 
and uh, and saw it again, and 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 he studied the star back down at his office in Pasadena, um, and found some previous observations, and and found, of course, to his astonishment, uh, the tale is pretty well known. Forgive me if you know all this uh, already, but that it was not a nova, of course, but a particular kind of variable star, a Cepheid variable, uh, with a very uh, well known period luminosity relationship and uh, absolute brightness. So uh, astonishingly, uh, he scratched out the end there, as you can see on this famous plate and wrote Ver um, for variable star. Um, and in one sort of fell swoop here, he discovered uh, the nature of galaxies, if you will, or the beginning of the nature of galaxies, and also the beginning of understanding the cosmic distance scale because he calculated that this Andromeda Nebula then was a million light years away, um, which at the time was three times the size of what anyone thought the entire universe, uh, the scale of the, the entire cosmos was. Of course, now we know it's 2.5 million light years away. But this was an astonishing breakthrough uh, for Hubble. And so he really, in a single observation, reset the cosmic distance scale and decipher, began the decipherment of the nature of galaxies. Research by Hubble, of course, and by earlier astronomers too, like V.M. Slipher at Lowell Observatory, uh, determined the universe was expanding. Uh, galaxies seem, the spiral nebulae galaxies seem to be uh, moving apart from each other. This, some of these observations were notable from Slipher and Flagstaff as early as 1912, well before Hubble, um, with his uh, with Slipher's new built uh, spectrograph there. Um, and of course, tracing this backwards in time, the movements of most galaxies away from each other, uh, this eventually helped to lead to the concept of what we know now as the Big Bang and the the uh, universal genesis, if you will, of the cosmos. Well, as with all sciences, of course, for a long, long time, the early days of galaxy research, uh, before understanding the nature of galaxies and the evolution and, and origin and fate of galaxies, it was really a business of classification, whether it be butterflies or minerals or bones or, or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of classification, of course, that has to go on early on to understand the context of, of these objects. Hubble, of course, uh, created the famous tuning fork classification scheme and, and published it and popularized it in his 1936 book, The Realm of the Nebulae, uh, and predominantly was uh, uh, fired up about spiral galaxies, barred spiral galaxies, and elliptical galaxies. Um, and quite a while later, of course, the evolution of the classification scheme continued and the great French astronomer who ended up at uh, Texas in Austin, uh, Gerard de Valcalour, expanded in sophistication the classification of galaxies tremendously. Of course, I had the good fortune um, of knowing him toward the end of his life. And of course, he created at the, at the very end of the 1950s this sort of cosmic lemon, much more sophisticated classification scheme that took into account all sorts of details of galaxies, bars, whether a galaxy showed rings of encircling material, uh, the tightness or, or looseness of the, the spiral arms, many other factors. And uh, of course, irregular galaxies, Hubble had talked about irregular galaxies, but peculiar galaxies and all sorts of uh, weirdo objects that were really not understood at all till much later. So it was an exciting time, but it was really a time for a long while of classification. Well, by the mid 20th century, astronomers realized that galaxies, of course, are the basic building blocks of the universe. They're stars, gas, uh, and dust contain most of the visible matter of the universe. For many years recently, Astronomers have uh, fixed on a rough number of galaxies uh, in the universe of roughly 100 billion. Of course, as you, I'm sure you guys know, you're a very sophisticated group compared to uh, some amateur astronomy enthusiast groups, I think. But uh, of course, if cosmic inflation, the early inflationary history of the universe is true, which it, there's a lot of credence for, 
um, then the visible universe, of course, is not nearly the whole universe. And it could be uh, much greater than that or even infinite, actually. But let's be conservative and talk about the visible universe. And that may be something on the order of 100 billion galaxies. That's an awful lot. And don't worry, I'm not going to talk about every one of them tonight. Um, a 2016 study by uh, one of our friends who's written for the magazine is a good guy. He's in England is Chris Consolis, uh got a lot of press a few years ago and talked about maybe the universe had one or possibly even two trillion galaxies as a population of galaxies in it. But of course, remember that telescopes are time machines. And as we look at uh, further and further and further away, farther and farther away, we're looking further and further back in time. So um, it's become clear, of course, over time, uh, through a number of important studies at different points from the 1950s, essentially onward, that galaxies uh, collide and merge and they grow from many into larger objects. And so long ago, we may have had a couple trillion galaxies and uh, closer to the present time, if you will, in the universe, we have maybe 100 billion. So, well, where do we start with understanding galaxies? Uh, the Milky Way at home, the Milky Way. Um, this is a very nice uh, Chilean view, of course, of the Milky Way with Alma pictured there. Um, you guys have a great view of the Milky Way where you are. I hope in a, a number of years now to retire out near you guys, and I will again. Wisconsin is not the place to see it. Uh, but on any dark night, of course, you guys know you can go out and see the luminous band of the Via Lactea, as the Romans called it after an earlier Greek term um, of the luminous milky band of light uh, crossing the sky. This is, of course, our galaxy's uh, light uh, as viewed from within. Um, there are roughly about 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. We don't know, of course, exactly how many uh, stars are in the galaxy because red dwarfs, which are by far the most numerous stars, are faint. So they're hard to see, of course, over long distances. Um, I'll talk about this uh, in a little bit more detail a little bit later. But, but now, of course, we know that the Milky Way is a barred spiral that's relatively recent research uh, in, uh, that we didn't really understand until uh, the past couple of decades, which is uh, pretty incredible and exciting. And of course, the sun and the solar system lie about 26,000 light years and change out from the galactic center. The center of the galaxy, of course, lies toward the constellation Sagittarius. And, and some of you may know, if, if you look between the open, it's essentially on a line near close to the midpoint of a line between the open cluster M6 and the Lagoon Nebula is essentially the direction of the center of the galaxy. Um, it's a good thing, of course, that we're a long way out from the galactic center because there are dangers as things get more crowded, if you will, in, in toward the centers of galaxies. And we'll talk about this a little more later, but of course, we know that our galaxy has a uh, 3.4 million solar mass black hole um, in its center, and there, you know, is antimatter and and lots of other dangers. So it's it's good to be out uh, in the quiet suburbs of the of the galaxy. I'm sorry, did I say 3.4? I meant 4.3 million suns for the mass of the black hole. Um, of course, the galactic center is shrouded by lots of dust. This is an infrared view, of course, here. But the galactic center is shrouded uh, uh, by a tremendous amount of dust in, vis in terms of visible light. And so we are seeing as we gaze toward uh, Sagittarius, essentially toward the middle of the galaxy, we're seeing maybe about a quarter of the way uh, toward the galactic center, and that's about it. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah, coming in just go, just fine. Good. I just heard some background noise go silent, and I was, was hoping I didn't lose everyone there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Well, galaxies like people uh, hang out in groups, uh, of course, some containing more than others. 
our group of galaxies is called the local group of galaxies, a, you know, a term that Hubble himself introduced in his book, The Realm of the, Gal of the Nebulae in 1936. Uh, it contains at least 55 galaxies, maybe as many as 100. Again, uh, as with stars, it's difficult to see dwarf galaxies. Of course, it's there, uh, especially if they're heavily obscured. Um, and there, there are examples like MAFI-1 and, and MAFI-2 that weren't uh, discovered in, until the 1960s and so on, and, and, and uh, many others. Of course, the prime galaxies in our group, uh, the three big ones are the Andromeda Galaxy, the Milky Way, um, and the Triangulum or Pinwheel Galaxy M33. Those are the three big spirals or barred spiral, the Milky Way. Um, the others are all small irregulars and dwarfs. Of course, you can see two nice dwarfs with the Andromeda galaxy here, M32, up above the disk, and NGC 205 with a nicely tidally warped envelope of, of uh, nebulosity of gas around it below. The large galaxies often have small satellites, of course, and uh, as we get on to talking a little bit more about the lives of galaxies, we'll understand that often the dwarf galaxies aren't uh, around too long. Well, the Triangulum Galaxy, as opposed to Andromeda, which is 2.5 million light years away, the Triangulum Galaxy is, is just a tad over 3 million light years away, a little farther away. Um, so, of course, the light uh, from it took three million years to reach us. Uh, it is uh, famous for uh, containing many uh, large pink so-called H2 ionized hydrogen regions of star formation. You can see them in this beautiful image here quite nicely. Um, one of them, NGC 604, which is up in the upper right of the top uh, above and right at the center of the galaxy, is is a huge, is one of the largest star formation regions known. So it's very active in terms of star formation, um, but it is a major anomaly, M33, because again, we'll get to this in a little bit later, but um, it's become clear that most normal galaxies have central supermassive black holes like the Milky Way, uh, but M33 doesn't. Dwarf galaxies really don't have them. And they tend to evolve and grow uh, essentially in, in uh, parallel uh, with the mass of the galaxy overall. M33, though, is a notable exception of a fairly sizable spiral galaxy that lacks a super uh, massive central black hole. Well, of course, funny things can happen in space, although they're generally separated uh, by large distances. And generally speaking, as uh, goes all the way back originally to 1912 in Flagstaff there, galaxies are generally moving apart from each other. Um, however, there are galaxies that are very close to each other uh, and, and gravity plays a big role in some of their lives as well, particularly in rich groups and, and clusters of galaxies. Um, but despite the universal expansion, Many galaxies, of course, collide and, and merge, uh, and they've done that over a long, long time since the early history of the universe. So local motions can send galaxies uh, toward each other. And this is a beautiful example, of course, the antennae um, of galaxies that are in mid-merger and will come together and, and become a, a, a single galaxy, presumably, and, and these beautiful tidal tails are visible to us, of course, right now. Over time, many galaxies uh, merge to form much larger structures than the, than the uh, early predominant uh, precursors. Um, this is not a terrible thing. It's simply what galaxies do. They eat each other. It's normal behavior as they're close to each other. And of course, our own Milky Way, which whose disk we think formed about 9 billion years ago, might have consisted originally of something like a hundred tiny proto galaxies uh, that came together to eventually form the barred spiral that, that we're in. And of course, our friend Avi Loeb at Harvard a number of years ago and his colleagues produced a 
significant study of the Andromeda galaxy, which is uh, not moving away from us, it's heading toward us. And something on the order of four and a half to five billion years from now, uh, the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way will collide. It's about 300 kilometers per second, the radial velocity toward us. So Avi created the name, uh, which is cute and funny, and people love it, of course, of Milkamada to uh, describe the um, galaxy that will result from the eventual collision of the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy. Of course, life on Earth at that point, there may be many civilizations around, or who knows, maybe even uh, descendants of ours. They will not be on Earth. Life on Earth will be over about a billion years from now when the oceans boil off of our planet. But one day this will happen, this great galactic uh, collision and the Andromeda galaxy will become larger and larger and larger in our sky and it will be really something to see. Well, as we move farther out into the universe, we of course encounter larger structures of galaxies. The Virgo cluster, a good friend of all of ours in the Springtime evening sky, of course, is the nearest big group of galaxies. It contains about 1,300 galaxies overall. Uh, the center of the Virgo cluster is about 54 million light years away. The diameter of the local group is about 10 million light years. So that's about five diameters of our little galaxy group uh, away from the distance to the Virgo cluster. Um, of course, dozens of galaxies in the Virgo cluster are visible very nicely and, and can be imaged very nicely with amateur telescopes from a dark sky site, which is a great uh, treat for us. And of course, the Virgo cluster contains uh, all kinds of galaxies, including one of the largest nearby galaxies, the giant elliptical M87. Now, Originally, and for many decades, nobody really knew why elliptical galaxies existed or how you make them. But the uh, uh, apparent answer now that's generally agreed on pretty well uh, is that um, as galaxies form and gravity brings matter together, kind of analogous in a sense to a, a, the way a primordial solar system and a disk forms around stars, we get a rotating disk with angular momentum. So it's generally believed that elliptical galaxies form by collisions and mergers. And that's how you get a big, crazy mess. And of course, in this galaxy, one of the largest near us, it's not only the, the uh, galaxy that contains a supermassive central black hole, nearly a thousand times greater in mass than the Milky Way's, uh, whose shadow a couple of years ago was imaged, you know, not the black hole, but the shadow, if you will, of the black hole. Uh, but I don't know if you can see this on your screen, but above and just above and to the right of the pinpoint center of M87, you can see a little jet in this image. I'm hoping you can see it. Um, and that's a jet of material that is falling in toward this very massive black hole, of course, and being ejected because it's not uh, falling into the event horizon. Which is it, pretty. It is visible on my screen. It it is. Yeah. Good. 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 Um, and so it's it's quite impressive that a, a galaxy of this distance, amateur. This is a very high end amateur uh, shot, and you can you can uh, you know even at that distance image the result of a supermassive black hole, which is quite amazing. And of course, another incredible fact about this galaxy, which is not all that much larger than the disk size of the Milky Way, the diameter of M87, but it's spherical. So the mass that it holds rather than a flattened disk, disk galaxies are very flat with a thick disk that's only a couple or 3000 light years across. This is a big sphere. So it's much, much more massive as a galaxy. And you can see all sorts of little fuzzy stars also, I hope, in this frame, which are globular clusters uh, belonging to M87. Uh, uh, we have um, about, well, about something on the order of 200 globulars uh, that belong to the Milky Way, we believe. M87 has 12,000 globular clusters that are attached to it, which is quite impressive. 
Farther away in the cosmos, of course, lie much more exotic galaxies. This is a distant galaxy called the Einstein Cross, uh, showing the universe acting as a lens. And of course, what we have is really an intervening galaxy here and a quasar that's directly behind the galaxy's nucleus that is, whose light, as Einstein predicted, uh, is being separated and lens uh, into four distinct images of the quasar that is just exactly behind it. Quasars, of course, uh, Martin Schmidt at Caltech in 1963 and colleagues stumbled on to these incredibly intensely bright uh, pinpoint uh, quasi-stellar objects, the name, the origin of the name. Um, and this was a big mystery how these distant things could be so bright. Um, and we'll get to the answer soon. But uh, this was, is a stellar example of one that was discovered uh, later on. Well, the deepest images of the universe ever taken are a series of images called the Hubble Deep Field. This is one of the ultra deep field Hubble images. And these are tiny uh, pieces of sky in the southern sky, of course, very small areas um, that are were relatively empty uh, and with extremely long uh, uh, exposure, uh, additive exposures, of course, with HST. Um, and they show infant galaxies less than a billion years old. Some of the uh, earliest galaxies that we know of very well. And you can see a lot of these that are sort of bluish, tiny pinpoint blobs in this image. There are a few uh, uh, Milky Way field stars in here. Most of them you can see have diffraction spikes. Uh, but most everything in this frame is a galaxy. There are more than 10,000 galaxies in this tiny piece of sky. Um, and so this is sort of the best glimpse that we have of the earliest galaxies uh, that eventually came together to uh, merge and make normal galaxies later in cosmic time like the one we're in now. Of course, the Webb Space Telescope, uh, we have an, a major story that's kind of sitting right now from by the PI John Mather um, who uh, it, it looks like there may be another, you know, slight delay in the launch of the Webb Space Telescope, which in a sense is, in a, is sort of in a poetic sense is kind of a, a successor to Hubble, although of course the wavelength uh, range is different. Um, and one of Webb's, of course, major uh, reasons for being is to uh, image the earliest stars and galaxies because we really don't know. This is a major unresolved question uh, that we still don't know. What was the sequence of formation of early objects in the universe? S stars, galaxies, or black holes? Which came first and how did they assemble? We don't know yet. And, and so maybe the Webb telescope, is, it looks like it may not launch in October now, but we may get it up a month or two or three later, I hope. And that should uh, give us the best information on the earliest matter in the cosmos, which will be exciting. Well, getting back to Martin Schmidt, since the 1960s, astronomers, of course, have pieced together the story of these strange, highly ener energetic objects uh, seen around the sky. This is 3C273, one of the first ones, along with 3C48, that Schmidt uh, studied and were very perplexing because they were seemed to be so, so bright and so distant. There came to be, during the 1960s and 70s, a whole cosmic zoo of strange, weird, distant objects of all different kinds. There were quasars, B. Lacerte objects, Seifert galaxies, named after the American astronomer Carl Seifert, many other things that seem to all be sort of a different uh, range of high energy weirdo objects. Well, uh, by the 1980s, it began to be clear that these were essentially the same kinds of objects, more or less, that were viewed from different geometries and that they all represented active galaxies with black holes in their centers that now Black holes in their youth uh, generally have a lot of material near them in, in early and young and evolving galaxies. So a lot of stuff comes in and gets ejected out as well as falling into the event horizon. They're very active. Over time, black holes become more quiescent 
and go to sleep, um, like the one that is pretty sleepy in the middle of our galaxy. Um, unless there are things like, uh, you know, clouds of stuff falling into them uh, locally or mergers of galaxies that can reawaken black holes and, and cause all manner of explosive star birth again in galaxies. This wakes them up and gives you a big case of the cosmic flu again. Um, so some of the activity of central black holes in galaxies is uh, episodic. And this picture really came together after a tremendous amount, about 25 years of worry and research and confusion over these high energy, uh, mostly so-called active galaxies. Well, here's an incredible uh, example of an active galaxy. This is just a wild image, I think. Monstrous galaxies, this is Perseus A, NGC 1275, which is the central uh, centrally dominant, CD, centrally dominant galaxy in the Perseus uh, cluster of galaxies. Many of these have active and hungry black hole engines swallowing up loads of material and shooting what they don't uh, consume out at very high velocities. Just looking at this image, you can almost see the violence of what's going on with the gas and dust um, that is in tumult around this uh, very uh, powerful central engine of the black hole. We see the emissions, of course, as, as jets. Astronomers now understand, as I think I said earlier, uh, that most all normal galaxies, not dwarfs, but normal uh, full-size galaxies, if you will, um, have central black holes. It, it's the norm. Um, as the central engine runs out of nearby gas and stars, as I mentioned, they can quiet down. Um, but it has been a long, long road to try to understand uh, the ubiquitous nature of, of black holes. Galaxies exist in a gently balanced state uh, between stately grace and internal upheaval, often, especially galaxies in groups like this one. Sometimes throughout their lives, they undergo explosive events that uh, are crises that wake them up. And as galaxies evolve, their engines can reawaken and uh, neighbors can intrude, which disrupts the normal picture within them. As I mentioned, the eventually our stately barred spiral, uh, the Milky Way. Um, uh, oh, and I don't think I mentioned, let me go back and the, the discovery of the barred nature um, of the Milky Way actually came uh, from a group uh, using the Spitzer Space Telescope and an experiment called Glimpse, an instrument called Glimpse on Spitzer, just in the year 2008. And astonishingly, you know, you don't get to ring the bell for uh, small colleges in Wisconsin very often with, you know, sort of big astrophysical breakthroughs. But a fellow named Bob Benjamin at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater led that Glimpse team that really mapped in infrared the um, barred spiral nature of the galaxy and the best uh, view that we have of the arms, in, including the little Orion arm or spur that we're in. Um, so what we think, we don't know, but, but this is of course Centaurus A in, in the southern sky that is one of the really coolest southern galaxies of all. I think this is the result of a fairly violent merger. You can see, of course, in this uh, belt around the uh, sort of squashed elliptical uh, peculiar galaxy, uh, this incredible belt of dust that encircles it. You can see there's a lot of star formation that's going on because of the upheaval of in this galaxy. We don't know, of course, really yet, but it may be that eventually um, six or seven billion years from now, the Milky Way and Andromeda may make a galaxy that's, that's something like this mess. So we will no longer have presumably our stately, uh, well-organized disk. Well, uh, I mentioned before cosmic inflation that uh, Alan Guth and Andre Linde uh, sort of independently uh, came up with in 1974, um, which is this idea that the universe uh, hyperinflated a fra tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. 
um, from these about the size of a pea up to about the size of a grapefruit. And that explains a fair amount of what we see in the visible universe much later. Um, if inflation is true, which I think it's fair to say most cosmologists have very high confidence in, um, then as I mentioned, the visible universe is not the whole universe, um, but is just a, a portion of it. And in fact, uh, I, my, my mind sort of hits a wall in sort of arguing and talking about this kind of stuff with somebody like Alex Filipenko, who says, no, really, the universe could well be infinite, you know, which sounds uh, uh, counterintuitive, but, but it, it may be true. But let's set that aside. Let's think about sort of an average number of stars in a good sized galaxy. And then we have about 100 billion galaxies, give or take, conservatively. Um, so that maybe gives us about 10,000 billion billion stars in the universe, roughly, as a conservative estimate. We see planets, of course, uh, as uh, there are more than 4,700 exoplanets now known, uh, generally speaking, pretty close to us in, in the Milky Way. Um, Tess is out there going crazy right now um, as the essentially the successor to Kepler. Um, so it appears, and it's, it makes sense, that you know, planetary formation is common around stars. We know through spectroscopy, of course, that chemistry is universal in the cosmos. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, we have an example, of course, of exactly one planet where there's life. Uh, but we do know that the basic building blocks of, of life, if you will, amino acids, glycine was discovered in the only cometary sample from stardust that was re that was returned to to earth so and and of course organic complex organics uh, exist in quite a number of meteorites and so on so you know how common is life of course a lot of this stuff is driven by this oldest philosophical question you know are we alone or how much life is out there we don't know, of course, there's only one example, but uh, and, and the thing that's a little disconcerting to people uh, in terms of their excitement, having grown up in, you know, a, a, a long heritage of sci-fi movies, um, you know, not only is it impressive that most aliens, apparently, at least according to Hollywood, you know, are bipedal organisms with two eyes, but uh, if I remember my original Star Trek episodes accurately, many of them understand English, you know, but, but seriously, you know, the, dist the cosmic distance scale, which Hubble really gave us the first step on understanding, is so incredibly vast. You know, if we think of one centimeter as one AU, the distance between Earth and the sun, we've traveled physically a tiny, tiny fraction of that one centimeter. And just the inner edge of the Oort cloud, the edge, physical edge of our solar system would be 10 football fields to the right uh, or left on that scale. Uh, and that's only a quarter of the way to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. It's an enormously huge distance scale, the universe, even the nearest stars around us. And it would take an incredible, technology aside gains, it would take an incredible amount of energy to move things from star system to star system that have mass. Of course, photons are massless. So... Um, it may be, you know, who knows? We don't know. There may be lots of life all over the universe, but they're never going to land. And despite what the, you know, Air Force allegedly says now this last couple of weeks, they may well never land in Central Park and take us to dinner, you know, at Tavern on the Green. But there is some research now on how galaxies relate to life, which is a very early uh, kind of interesting uh, thought process. Galaxies may have zones where uh, life may be more likely or may last longer at complex life, I mean, civilizations maybe even. Rocky worlds, of course, offer the best hope, uh, and these mean metal-rich stars. A galaxy like the Milky Way may have a habitable zone, mainly in the spiral arms, and maybe from about 10,000 to about 30,000 light years away from the center. So maybe, who knows, maybe we're on sort of the outer 
part of the best place in a disk galaxy to have life. Farther out may mean fewer metals, and farther in may mean greater dangers. But to conclude, and again, thank you for having me here tonight. It's a great pleasure. Even almost 100 years after Hubble's discovery now, we've only just begun. We've only just scratched the surface of understanding galaxies. Stay tuned. There's a tremendous amount to come, and a lot of it will start in a new way uh, once we get the Webb Space Telescope going soon here. So there's never been a more exciting time, I think, to study galaxies. And I thank you very much for allowing me to share uh, a little bit of excitement that I have about the subject with you tonight. Thank you, Dave. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, the James Webb Telescope, we all have our breaths held and our fingers crossed and we're turning blue. <laughs> you know, one more delay. You know, John, Mather, it's going to work like a truck because there's not only the launch, you know, but it's a very sophisticated rolling out in orbit then, you know, for the uh, for the deployment, which is is, uh, um, you know, something to be a little bit nervous about. He claims total high confidence, though. So I'm going to go with him. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, does have a Nobel Prize, you know. <laughs> and they, they've, uh, they're two for two on those fancy uh, Mars rover landings. So um, that's right. So yeah. there's building up some confidence there. Mars is working well recently, at least. For us. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Don't Hasn't always that. worked well in the past, but but it's it's working well recently. Yeah. Yeah. There, we've got one question. Um, yes. Do you think globular clusters are the cores of small galaxies that became absorbed? by large galaxies? Often, probably, yes. And we know, I think there's universal agreement that Omega Centauri is the, which is enormous as globulars go astrophysically. I think there's, there's almost universal agreement that Omega Centauri is the core of a failed dwarf galaxy. Yes. Hmm. And quite possibly others. And, and it's weird too, because of course the stars and globular clusters predate the disks of most normal galaxies. They're so old, you know, so it's a very strange, uh, we, you know, again, Webb may give us more insight as to how you get really old clusters of stars that eventually gravitationally end up to be largely bound by disk galaxies before the disks are fully assembled, you know, yeah. which is curious. Yeah. So let's see, Tal has a question. I'm going to see if I can get his microphone. Microphone um, active. Let's see. I thought I... Hmm. I don't see him. I don't know. Tal, can you, um, can you talk? Oh, I guess that was just a question, uh, a comment. You mentioned Dr. Carl Seifert. I met him at Dyer Observatory. Wow. And that was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, and, and down there, I was down there as well. And you know, the house that he lived in is still there too, which you can go in and it, Rocky Alvey, I think, has just retired, but was the director of Dyer for quite a number of years. And if you ring him up there, he'll give you a tour of Seifert's house. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, Jack, do you want to ask your question live? You just have to unmute yourself. You should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, I'm not seeing Jack unmuting himself. But uh, he, his question is, what, what's that telescope you have there in the background. Oh, behind you. Yeah. yeah, this is just a prop because I've had, you know, a thousand Zoom meetings in the last year here in this room. But this is a an astrophysics four inch uh, uh, APO from 1990 or thereabouts, um, a Starfire, uh, which was in the olden days, we, we used to get review copies that the telescope companies would send us and they never wanted anything back. So I think we ended up giving away 
40 or 50 telescopes over the last 40 years, you know, but they don't do that so much anymore, though, <laughs> the telescope companies, unfortunately. Oh, well, <laughs> it's good while it lasted. Okay, Henry has a question. Uh, you should be live, Henry. Okay, uh, thank you. Great talk. Uh, what's your take on the, uh, uh, the possibility of uh, finding intermediate mass black holes in the centers of globular clusters and or say the dwarf galaxies? Or some of them? Very good, I think. Yeah, I think they will be found. Uh -huh. You know, okay. it's very hard, you know, okay, I didn't, I didn't actually mention this, I probably should have, and I was afraid I was rambling on too long. But you, you guys probably know the story as far as stellar black holes go, you know, uh, John Mitchell, the English natural philosopher, which was a term for anyone who thought about any science, you know, 200 years ago, but this was, uh, you know, more than 200 years ago, the concept of a dark star that would have such a an intense gravitational field that light wouldn't escape. That was proposed more than 200 years ago. Right. And the first evidence for a stellar black hole came along in 1975, Cygnus X1. And of course, Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne famously bet each other, although they both believed it would become a, it would turn out to be a black hole. Um, they bet each other. And of course, being a good sport, Stephen took the opposite view and lost the bet. And, and uh, so he had to send not popular mechanics, a subscription, which he wanted, but a subscription to penthouse for Kip, you know, to tell <laughs> but, but, uh, but that took 15 years. That was 1990 to confirm the first stellar black hole. We're just on the verge, I think, of discovering a lot of intermediate mass black holes. But soon after that Cygnus X1 discovery, um, astronomers began to find supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies, largely using Hubble um, by large numbers. And John Cormandy, who's down at Texas, and his collaborators, including Lewis Ho, were uh, the ones who started to find lots of them. The Andromeda Galaxy, the Milky Way, M106, right on down the, the list. And as I said, it's now known that supermassive black holes are in the centers of the majority of normal galaxies. But you know how many black holes we still know, we know about now? Stellar black holes in the Milky Way? Yeah, millions. No that we actually specifically oh, we actually know about. There, there should be uh, many Not a real lot, I don't think. Exist, but, but we know of about two dozen stellar black holes in the Milky Way because they're so <laughs> damn hard to detect. They have to be interacting with a, with a right. partner, you know, in the right way. And so, so they're, and, and intermediate mass black holes are very hard to detect, it appears also. But they will be found. They should exist. They they will be in places like globular clusters, I think, too. Um, but it's funny that the most powerful and most exotic ones turned out to be the easy ones to get the evidence for in galaxies, in, in the cores, cores of galaxies. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to believe 100 years ago people didn't know there were galaxies. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's a pretty fundamental, you know, that's only a century old, the, right. the, the nature of galaxies that they contain matter. And of course, you know, we didn't even get into dark matter and dark energy, you know, which problems that came along more recently here. But, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, things have radically changed. And, and it's amazing, you know, before the 1920s that you didn't even know the scale of the universe at, at all. Um, which is incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could look into the future 100 years and um, see what they said. Gee, they didn't even know this. <laughs> you know, you know how did they not know this? <laughs> there's a temptation that because we don't know a lot and because technology will improve and we have a hell of a lot to learn, if you'll permit me saying so, that a lot of things that we think are going to turn out to be totally wrong, a lot of ordinary people think, you know, I don't think that what we don't know will countermand 
what we do understand about physics and about the law, about gravitation and relativity and so on, those laws of physics. However, you know, in the 1970s, um, th there was a famous book uh, called uh, Cosmic Discovery. Uh, Martin Harwin mm -hmm. wrote it and he estimated, now things have changed a little bit in the last generation, but mind you, but not that much. He estimated sort of analytically in this famous book that we know maybe of about 20% oh, of the kinds of astrophysical phenomena that ought to exist in the universe. And I can believe that, I think. So we have a heck of a lot to learn still, you know, in the future. Yeah, it's interesting you, you, you mentioned him. I don't know if um, you, you caught the Golden um, Webinar series today where he, he was the featured speaker. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah he has a, I he haven't has, talked he has a new to him book. in a long, long time. He was a very nice guy talking to him years ago. I think he was director of, as well as his astrophysical career, he was the director of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, I think, for a little while, too. Oh, wow. But uh, he's an interesting guy, yeah. Yeah, he, his his latest book they they call it the um, uh, the third book in his in, in his trilogy, the Cosmic mm -hmm. Messengers: the, the Limits of Astronomy in an Unruly Universe. I did right. not know of it. I will have to look it up. Thank you for that. Wow. Yeah, it's just what a coincidence. I, I saw his talk today, and you and you yeah. mentioned him right now. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, he he's a great guy and and a brilliant guy, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, I think he's getting up there in years, but um, he's got to be really yeah. up there. Yeah, yeah. But you're right; his his, his ideas are they're definitely worth uh, re reading about. He's he's quite an innovative thinker. I think at least he was. Yeah, I'm sure he still is. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions for Dave? Got um. Don't be shy. <laughs> or maybe. I guess um, we're, we're questioned out then. All right, uh, just thank you one, once more, Dave. Uh, wonderful talk, it's very, uh, very nice. Well, thank you, thank you so much for having me and, and I hope to make it out to Arizona in person one of these days. Yeah, definitely look us up uh, when, you, when you do. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much, I sure enjoyed it. Okay, and I'll turn the meeting back over to our president, Gordon. Hello mm -hmm. all, and uh, Dave, yeah. of course, thank you for that very interesting presentation. This is what our club is all about, is bringing uh, such great presentations to our membership, things that uh, obviously we're all interested in, and galaxies are one of those. <clears throat> Plus, uh, I know I speak for the club, that uh, we also thank you for all of your contributions to the astronomy community, and uh, hope that you continue with that. Well, thank you. I, I sure will. And it's very nice of you to say that. And, and I look forward to a day when things are normalizing here and we can all be uh, looking at some galaxies and some big telescopes together at a yeah. star party somewhere. Yeah, the Grand yeah. Canyon. Good, good. Yeah. And if, you, and if you retire here in Arizona, you got to come join our club. You know, I sort of have my eye on Tucson, but if I do that, I will still join your club. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can be. Uh, you can be in two. <laughs> yeah, and I'll certainly be going up to Flag. I'm. I'm a member of the board at Lowell, so I. I, I will be spending some time in Flagstaff. I can go right through and visit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see, uh, guys. Uh, oh, um, in fact, speaking of props, I've had a few questions about Snoopy back there. That there's always Snoopy in my. Uh, in my uh, picture. And Snoopy has been with me since 1972. And uh, uh, pictures of me usually involve Snoopy somewhere. I'm back a while ago, it was kind of popular. If people were taking trips, they would bring a gnome or something like that. And if they took a selfie, they would have that gnome somewhere in the background. I had a friend of mine who had a rubber chicken that, uh, you know, if ever he was traveling around, and you would take a picture of something, there'd be a rubber chicken somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in the picture. So that's that's why Snoopy is there. He's been there uh, since 1972. Your good times and not so good times. So remember that next month, Friday the 18th of June, 7.30 p.m., our next meeting, Bob King. 
will be presenting adventures in visual observation, visual observing. So that's something that we've all done. So uh, come and join us again, and we'll get a presentation from him. So let's see. Let's look and see if there's any more questions before I give the usual countdown. Uh, there, there was one question there, a, a, a late one. Is, is Halton Harp um, ideas on cate categorizing uh, peculiar galaxies, is, are any of his um, ideas being... Uh, okay, I think I think we lost um, I think we lost Dave though. Okay, all right, we'll have to save that question for another time. And do a countdown, Gordon. Okay, looks like uh, do one more check here. So usual rocket countdown. Three, two, one. Bye, y'all. See you next month. <laughs>